So today we have the pleasure of hearing from one of our own members, Elaine Harbison, who I will add is a graduate of a sermon writing workshop. Um, she was brought up a Christian scientist, but by the time she was about 12, she knew that there was a little bit more to religion than she was learning. Um, at UCSB, she spent much of her parents' hard-earned monies. She studied Buddhism, Islam, politics, sociology, European literature, and finally, she majored in psychology. She attended the UU um, fellowship or church downtown before she came and joined us here 31 years ago. Um, you may remember that Elaine was very much a part of RE, both of her children who are now grown up, Danny is 37 and Toby is 34. Both of them attended Live Oak um, up until the eighth grade. She has a wonderful resume of the work that she's done since then. So chat her up and find out. And I would say she should look back with pride on all that she has done. So welcome, Elaine, and thank you for adding your uh, wonderful thoughts later today in the service. Good morning. The story I've chosen is The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And for those of you that are familiar with this story and find it problematic, don't worry, we have a surprise ending provided by Kristen's daughter, Lulu. Start at the beginning. Once there was a tree and she loved a little boy. And every day, the boy would come. And he would gather her leaves. And make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk. And swing from her branches. Look up there for the feet hanging from the branch and eat apples, and they would play hide and go seek. And when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boy loved the tree very much, and the tree was happy. And the little heart says, me and tea. But time went by and the boy grew older. Now it says me and YL, which I think means young love. As you can see, there's two sets of feet down there. And the tree was often alone. Then one day, the boy came to the tree and the tree said, come boy, climb, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in the shade and be happy. I am too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have some money and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up in the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time and the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back and the tree shook with joy. And she said, come boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife, I want children, and so I need a house. Can you give me a house? Then I will be happy. Now the original story goes on to have the tree cutting herself down to a stump. Thank goodness for the new ending. And the tree said, it's time we set some boundaries. <laughs> and the tree was happy.
This is a sermon that I wrote in 2011, right after my daughter had graduated from college. And for those of you who haven't taken a sermon writing class, I have to say that every one of us said, I can never write a sermon. I will never get up in front of the congregation and give it. And every single one of us did. So <laughs> be bold. The excitement of my daughter's college graduation had built up for months. It had been four long and often difficult years with stress, illness, cross-country flights, and emotional turmoil. And my daughter experienced some of these things too. <laughs> she was a very hardworking student all her life, and she had chosen to go to an expensive college in Virginia, almost 3,000 miles away. I had promised her throughout her school years, you do the work to get in, I will make sure you have the financing. At the time, I had absolutely no idea how I was gonna do this. I had some vague hope about financial aid. I knew for a fact that Susie Orman did not approve of this line of thinking, because at that time of life, I should have been saving for my own retirement. I did realize that I might never be able to retire because of the financial choices I had made but this was important to me. So with a combination of grants, loans, scholarships, and borrowing against my house and against my retirement, the task was accomplished. As her graduation date approached, I found myself thinking about the odds against us, the obstacles both of us had overcome. And although my part of the deal was primarily financial, I also felt I had struggled with her through that minefield that is college life far from home. I was enormously proud of her and proud of myself for having kept that promise. I felt all of this very deeply on that weekend in May when we gathered to celebrate at the beautiful historic campus, William and Mary. The air was hot and humid, the landscape lush and green. We were surrounded by friends and family members who had traveled from California to be there. The ceremonies were grand. Professors praised their students as brilliant scholars. Speakers congratulated and inspired. I remember looking down our row of seats at the faces of my family and realizing it was a peak moment in all of our lives. But when all this had worn off and everyone had gone home, I began to feel the other side. The following day, as I returned from dropping the last family member at the airport, I began to feel unbearably sad. I was in tears and I didn't know why. It was as if I were suddenly feeling the overwhelming weight of what it had cost me, not just in money, but in effort and in time. I realized that my daughter had no idea what it had cost me, but I wanted her to know. I wanted her to value what I had given up, how hard I had worked. Why didn't she know? Because I had carefully hidden it from her. Is this what self-sacrifice is about? I remembered something from before my children were born, something my mother had said to me when she was dying of cancer. Each time I saw her in the nursing home, I knew it might be the last, so every visit was precious. But this one, in 1986, just before she died, was particularly memorable. She had seen something on television a study showing a correlation between personality traits and personality traits and the development of cancer. Now remember this was 38 years ago. The theory was that people with certain attitudes were more likely to develop cancer. This had struck a chord in her. As I sat by her bed, she took my hand and said, "Don't let this happen to you. Don't give in to self-pity." I was shocked to hear my mother, who had never complained about anything, who always took the positive attitude, talking about self-pity. What was the source of the self-pity that she felt had led to her illness? At the time, I thought I might know what she meant, that she maybe she had realized too late what she had sacrificed trying to be the perfect 1950s wife and mother, a dilemma not uncommon for women of her generation. She had raised three children, who at that point only partially recognized, much less truly appreciated, what she had given us and what she had given up to do it. It wasn't until after her death 
that I learned of my mother's many artistic accomplishments as a young woman growing up in San Antonio. She had been an active leader in college, voted most representative girl, and married my dad in 1941 at the age of 20. She had never talked about any of these things to us, her children. She seemed to have turned into another person entirely, not an artist, not a person with needs of her own. She had given up her art, some of who she was, and most of her adult life to become a housewife and mother. Is this what self-sacrifice is about? There was another reason she especially wanted to warn me about self-sacrifice and self-pity. Sandwiched between two difficult and more demanding children, my brother and sister, I had from infancy an amiable, non-assertive personality. I avoided conflicts at all costs, always being more comfortable giving in, not knowing how to ask for what I needed. I could always be counted on to put other people's needs and feelings before my own. I was headed straight down that road to self-sacrifice. When I became a mother, despite my own mother's warnings, I went into full-scale, extreme, selfless mode. Now, most parents put a great deal of time, energy, money into the raising of their children, and it's a perfectly natural thing. It's instinctive, and um, usually uh, we give unselfish unselfishly to our children. After the birth of each of my children, I felt that maternal love. I knew that I would give up my life to protect this child's life. So did I at that point understand the sacrifices my mother had made? No, not yet. I understood the impulse to sacrifice, but it would take another 20 years for me to understand the cost. During the five years when I was a full-time mother and homemaker myself, I spent countless hours, in addition to all the housework and chores, volunteering in the schools, volunteering for team sports, music programs, RE, church functions, and at the food co-op, as many parents do. But even after I was divorced and employed full-time, I felt I had to keep up all of these things. I was exhausted all the time. I loved my children and loved being with them, but I never gave myself a break. It makes me sad now to think back on when I didn't feel I deserved any time off or self-care. I realize now that I felt guilty for what I considered an unforgivable failure on my part, the failure to provide my children with an intact, stable home. To make up for this, I was determined to provide them with everything that the two-parent families could provide. With the good intention of protecting them from the negative effects of divorce, I went way overboard in shielding them from the realities it entailed. I had twice the workload and half the income of their friends' parents. It was an impossible undertaking. I lay awake every night, anxious and worrying about what I had left undone. And so, like my mom, I sacrificed too much of myself while raising my children. I owe a great debt to my friends, some of whom are here today, for keeping me going with their emotional support and practical support during this time. Fortunately, I had begun attending Live Oak when we moved to Goleta in 1991. I had belonged to the downtown congregation before my marriage, drawn to their social activism. When I started attending Live Oak, I thought it was for religious education for my children, but I soon discovered it was also for my own spiritual healing. The warmth and support I felt here was so affirming. Betz's sermons about the grieving process, attitudes toward money and abundance, examining our more difficult feelings, messages of hope and faith, all seemed to be tailored to my needs. Each Sunday I felt a spiritual cleansing. I felt fortified to face the week ahead. I saw how supportive community worked. I immediately began teaching RE and singing in the choir years before actually becoming a member of the church. Slowly over these years, the price of self-sacrifice was becoming clearer to me. I was burned out. I resented and envied other people who would put work aside to do what made them happy. I once complained to Live Oak member Elise Murphy 
after foolishly missing her birthday party, I can't remember if it was her 80th or her 90th, but I shouldn't have missed it. I said, Elise, I don't have the energy to do any of the things I want to do because I am too tired from doing all the things I have to do. She replied gently, no, Elaine, you have it backwards. You are tired because you are not doing the things you want to do. I knew she was right and that I was the one who was stopping myself from doing what I wanted. Because of my very ethical upbringing, I tended to see everything as a moral dilemma. As Bob Dylan said, if something's not right, it's wrong. What is right or wrong in the choices between selfish and unselfish? In my childhood, selfish was absolutely wrong. Coming from my parents, selfish or self-centered was the worst thing you could call someone. The idea of me time had not been discovered, not in my world anyway. But striving for selflessness was not creating a happy life for me. All my life, as I tried to do everything right, I wondered why irresponsible people seemed to be having a lot more fun than I was. <laughs> I was perplexed. <laughs> the tide turned for me about 15 years ago when I was taking classes in mediation. One assignment was to interview people about their styles of conflict. I called a relative, <clears throat> someone who I had always considered to be very selfish. She told me, by sheer force of personality, I always get my way. Boy, did I know that. <laughs> my own style was to be the peacemaker and always give in. Imagine what our relationship was like. Well, this was an aha moment for me. I realized she was taking care of her needs and I was not. Then my mediation teacher gave me a CD entitled, Why Nice Doesn't Work. It outlined ways we feel trapped into putting others first at the cost of our own happiness. I listened to it over and over. It had me pegged. I understood for the first time what I had done for, to myself. My behavior toward this relative changed. I spoke my mind. I stood up for myself. I set limits. Our relationship improved immediately. And so a few years later, in 2011, I found myself in Virginia on that momentous day in May, facing the lingering effects of a lifetime of self-sacrifice and facing a new realization. I wasn't a saint after all. I wasn't 100% unselfish. I wanted a return on my investment. I wanted recognition and gratitude. I wondered if all my sacrifice might have been a mistake. On my return home to Santa Barbara, I looked for guidance to help me with this dilemma. I talked to close friends. I sat in church, letting the words and music and feelings wash over me. What is the purpose of life after all? What gives it meaning? What gives it value? What is worth sacrificing one's life for? One answer I find in Mary Oliver's poem, The Summer Day, it ends like this. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what, it, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What is good use of our precious days? How do we balance our obligations to ourselves and to others? One answer to these questions comes from our view as to what happens to us after we die. If there is an eternal afterlife completely determined by our actions in this one lifetime, a belief taught by Christian faith and others that many of us grew up in, yes, we are talking heaven and hell, We'd better be darn sure we're on the right side, and self-sacrifice is often required. Jesus did it, the saints did it, soldiers do it, suicide bombers do it. Most religions teach some form of self-sacrifice, but this view has us depending on others to define what leads to heaven or hell. I had chosen at age 12 not to become a member of the Christian Science Church in which I was raised. I couldn't subscribe to any creed that gave salvation to only a chosen few. 
I noticed that each faith selected a different set of people as the chosen few. I pay attention at memorial services to what is said about the deceased. It is often said, particularly of a woman, that she always put others first, particularly her family. In this context, it is offered as the highest praise in summarizing a life. I find myself thinking, sure, those of us left behind are happy because we were the recipients of her sacrifice. But what if no one knew or cared what she had done? To be praised and remembered, is this what matters in the end? More importantly, did she regret any of her own unrealized dreams? My conclusion is we don't want either extreme, to, neither to be completely selfish nor to be completely self-sacrificing. We can have both. The need for self-realization and personal happiness does not have to conflict with the desire to be of service to others. Because, as most of us know, doing good for others also, and maybe primarily, benefits ourselves. That's why it's called the common good. As we sang earlier, for all that is our life, we give our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good and to make our own days glad. It is in part from all of you that I have learned that in community, in sharing the load, we find love, meaning, and happiness. And that each of us is both a giver and a receiver. Both benefit from the feeling of abundance that is created and from the love that is shared. And so I say, above all else, make sure your choices and actions make you happy in this life. Howard Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Do everything you can for others without giving away too much of yourself. When I talked to Elise Murphy about this, she said, if you pay attention to your feelings, you will know when you are giving too much. Both my children are grown now. You'll be happy to know I did refocus my finances and I retired at 72. I'm 73 now. And um, most importantly, I spent the last five years of my work life doing the very rewarding and healing work of counseling people with addiction and alcoholism. And although my mom has been gone for over 37 years, I think of her now and I say, Mom, I do have some idea of what you sacrificed for us, and I know why. You showed me how to be loving and giving, but also to beware of too much self-sacrifice. And so remembering you, I now live my life with as much joy and pleasure as I can. I will use the remainder of my precious days doing things to increase both the happiness in my life and in the world. As for my daughter and my feelings after her graduation, before she came home to California, a card arrived from her. It said in part, Dear Mom, thank you for helping me out so much with graduation, the move back to California and college in general. I will always be grateful for all the hard work and sacrifice that you put in to ensure that I would be able to graduate from college. It was nice to be surrounded by so many family members at graduation. I will be home very soon. Much love, Toby. P.S. I will be financially independent as soon as possible. <laughs> in 2011, or when I gave the sermon in 2012, I said, may it be so. <laughs> now, 13 years later, we know that she has put herself through grad school, uh, got a master's in marine resource management, and now makes a good living as a research scientist for the state of Washington, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And she lives with her partner, Cole, in Oregon and has a six-month-old daughter, Jillian. May it be so.